Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of the uh, Reach Ministry Bible Study. Uh, today I'm just hoping and we'll be praying that the Lord just, you know, uh, open your eyes to His truth, uh, what He wants you to, to learn today on uh, Romans uh, chapter 13. That's going to be, uh, excuse me, chapter 14. That's going to be brought to you by Minister Carrie Pollard. And uh, man, as you can see, chapter 13 was, was just awesome and powerful. And now we're going to go with chapter 14 when I, I know uh, that my sister Carrie is just going to, you know, through the Holy Spirit, is going to just break it down and just open our eyes to what the Lord wants us to understand concerning His Word and how to... Uh, you know, uh, walk uh, uh, in His Word. Uh, so now I'm going to open up in prayer. And if you can uh, close your eyes and join me. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Father God. I thank you for this opportunity that you have given us. Lord, I ask, Father God, that you soften hearts, Father God. That you uh, allow people to uh, just... Uh, understand your word father god that it may be broken down father god so they can understand exactly uh what it is that you want them to know father god and i pray lord that 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 they they, they can get themselves out of the way father god so they can receive this word that you have for them father god we thank you father god we thank you that you have uh, uh given us the holy spirit father god to to come down and take over when we could never even consider doing something like this, Father God. We know that you have our backs, Father God. That you send the Holy Spirit to just guide us and to get your message out there to, to, to the people all over the world. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Evangelist Jonathan, yes. for opening <laughs> up and also opening us up in prayer. Well, I just want to welcome everybody right here into our Reach Ministry Bible Study. We just thank God for you. We know you could have been doing so many other things on this Saturday, but you decided to join in on us with this Bible study so that you could be edified. So I want you to do one thing for me before we really get going. I want you to be just to like this Bible study and then also share it with as many people as you possibly can. Because we see, we grow by hearing the Word of God Amen. and learning Amen. about the Word of God. Right. And so if you love your friends, you love your loved ones, make sure you're sharing this to them on yeah. social media. Later on, we're going to be uploading this into our um, Chosen Few Outreach Ministries YouTube channel. So if you have families and friends that aren't on Facebook, you can go there and you can actually share it from there to their personal text messages. And they'll have the ability to um, watch it on our YouTube channel. But without further ado, this woman of God, I love her so much. She's my wife. Praise God. Amen. And she's a mighty woman of God. She's a Amen. mighty teacher. I know that Amen. the word of God that is going to be taught today, that it's going to be a powerful word and that the Holy Spirit is truly going to use her. But without further ado, at this time, we're going to bring you up, Minister Carrie Pollard, to, pre to, um, to actually not preach, preach, teach. I call her teacher preacher. <laughs> <laughs> Romans chapter 14. Come on up. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I love you. Honey. Love you too, baby. Who praise the Lord. I'm a little bit late. I had to get my stuff together. Oh, oh, hey, it knows your Wi-Fi, so we're we're good to go. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Uh, wonderful to have be back in front of you guys teaching uh, God's word. I love the Lord's word. It is precious. It is a treasure. Um, but, you know, Minister Claudia said that she worries why she gets all the hard chapters. I think this one is in good competition with chapter 13 <laughs> as being one of the hard chapters. Uh, Romans chapter 14. Get myself there. So this is... This is going to be a little bit of a hard study um, for quite a few people. It was a little bit difficult for me, and I'm sure Minister Claudia can attest, is that when we get into studying, you know, these chapters that, you know, when there's conflict with our flesh, that we have to battle through that in order to gain the intent 
and purpose of God's word in order for us to teach that to you. Amen. So we got to we got to fight with our flesh first so that we can gain understanding so that the enemy cannot bring uh, thoughts or ideals, whatever, to our minds that will twist uh, the word of God so that it pleases our flesh. Amen. So we got a whole battle that we got to go through before we get up here in front of you guys. So this one was a tough one. And it's tough to a, a lot of people. And I believe the reason that it is tough is because we are unlearned. Mm. And that's the purpose of these Bible studies. These Bible studies are for us to to dive into God's word, to come to the correct understanding and interpretation of what the Holy Spirit is saying and to convey that to everybody, mm. whether we like it. Whether we don't like it, right. whether we've been taught it, whether it's tradition, it doesn't matter. That's right. Because the truth of God usurps it all. Amen. And that Amen. is what we should want. We should want the truth of God. Amen. Those of us that love the Lord. Amen. So we want to, you know, make sure that we understand scripture and uh, the content and context in which it was written. The other thing is that, you know. I know it's going to be difficult because as a species, we're real, you know, feely. We're a feely kind of species, you know, about how we feel is important. We live in a feely kind of culture. Mm -hmm. How I feel determines reality. <coughs> we all know that that's not uh, true. Amen. Um, and so what we need to understand is that God, and I know it's going to sound a little harsh, and I prayed that God would Come soften on. me and allow me to give this in love. But God doesn't care about your feelings. Amen. Come on. The Bible was not written with your feelings in mind. That's right. Amen. God wrote truth so that we could go after truth and we could put our, our flesh under subjection of that truth. Amen. So he doesn't care about our feelings. You know what I'm saying? Not that he's not compassionate and concerned. He is. That is the God that we serve. But when it comes down to truth, our feelings play no part. That's right. Amen. Amen. So some of y'all going to be in your feelings. I said that to say that some of y'all going to be in your feelings and I get it. I get it because I was in mine when I was studying. But your feelings are of no consequence to the scriptures. Amen. There is no consequence to the Holy Spirit when he inspired these scriptures. And sometimes he inspired these things in spite of our feelings. That's right. Amen. So I used to tell my husband that, you know, when God would send people to me, he would give me people specifically to evangelize to. And I was to say, if God sent you to me, he frustrated with you. <laughs> and I kind of felt this way about this chapter that God is like, I'm a little frustrated because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a little straight lazy. I don't I'm not going to sugarcoat and, and cover everything up because it'll make you feel better. That's just not the kind of person I am. God has softened me, but I'm still that individual. So when God sends me somebody, I'd be like, Ooh, frustrated with you because he sent you over here and you're not gonna get i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go oh woo, woo, woo. i'm not gonna give you that yes, so sir. there's no woo 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 today so what is this chapter about uh chapter 14 is about convictions mm. that's what it's about it's about convictions uh personal convictions and how we treat others with differing convictions okay the chapter is not this is what it is not because this chapter uh, has been and can be misused, twisted, uh, and taken out of context. So what Paul is not talking about, he is not talking about essential issues of the faith. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about foundational doctrine in this chapter. He's talking about secondary issues. This is what Paul is talking about. Secondary issues, right? Issues of liberty. This is what Paul is talking about. So in order to really get an understanding of where we're going, I always say we got to we not only have to stay in context with the chapter, but we have to stay in context with the book That's right. and what was going on. So what was Paul talking about? So we got to go back a couple of chapters. And so we in chapter 12, Paul is doing what he's given us instruction on how to live the Christian life. Talking about dedicating our bodies to God, not being conformed to this world, uh, not being prideful. Mm. You know, talks about specific Christian conduct in chapter 12. Then we go on to verse, I mean, chapter 13, which we had last time, 
with Minister Claudia and it still continues to give instructions on how to live the Christian life. In regards to government authority, we talked about that, and taxes and finance and, and where we are as Christians um, uh, as far as martyrdom is concerned, right? We learned that, yes, we are, we are to be martyred. That messed me up a little bit, I'm going to tell y'all. But God is good and his word is true. Um, chapter 13 talks about uh, loving your neighbor, right? But at the end of the chapter is the part that's important. Let me see. Hey, come on. The computer is the devil is a liar. Yeah. You don't like nobody doing nothing right. <laughs> okay, so down at the end of chapter 13, verses 12 through 14. So this is kind of the crescendo of this chapter. He says, the night is, is far gone and the day is almost here. Let us then drop or fling away the works and deeds of darkness and put on the full armor of light. The day of the Lord is coming. That's what he's saying. Let us live and conduct ourselves honorably and becomingly as in the open light of day. Not in reveling and drunkenness, not in immorality and debauchery, not in quarreling and jealousy. But clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for indulging the flesh. Put a stop to thinking about the evil cravings of your physical nature to gratify its desires. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's how Paul ends chapter 13. He says that for believers, we need to put on the full armor of Christ. Right. Making not provision for the flesh. We need to run after God with all we have. Right. Totally commit in following Jesus, Amen. right? Amen. Submitting uh, all of ourselves and our lives to his will and his purpose. So that's how it ends. So that's where the Christian should be. This is where his letter is taking us. But what happens? So what happens when a believer does those things, those last three chapters? So what happens at the end of that, when you commit yourself, when you sold it, you know, when you sold out for the Lord, what happens and what comes to pass is that personal convictions are created in order for you to maintain that commitment that you just made mm -hmm. to the Lord, Amen. to live yes. according to him, to not Amen. give what those things that Paul describes. So along with those come personal convictions right. in order to help you stay with that, yes. with that promise Amen. and with that commitment. That's right. Amen. Now, the thing is, is that sometimes those personal convictions are just that they're personal. Right. They're for you. Okay. They're not for everybody. But sometimes because they're so strong and intense for us, we tend to want to spread the wealth, right? And so here's the thing though, what happens is that when we make that commitment and those, those personal convictions come about and they come from the Holy Spirit, uh, that we, some people think that the convictions that one holds determines our proximity to the Lord, but that's not true. Your proximity to the Lord will determine your convictions. That's right. Because if I'm way over here and I'm one of them Christians that party Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and mm. Saturday and go to the church, what are my convictions looking like? My convictions are not looking too Come tough. On. My Come convictions on. are not looking too hard because of where I am, right? But if I do those things in prayer and fasting and reading my word and getting close to the Lord, then I will develop more convictions to keep me Amen. out of that place that I just came from. Right. And I continue to do those things and I get closer and closer to the Lord and I develop more convictions, right? Possibly to keep me out of that place, mm -hmm. right? But it's personal to me because God knows what's going to keep you out of this place and that place. And that's personal for you because we serve a personal and a holy God. Amen. So that's personal for you, but it doesn't mean it applies to everyone else. So we should have an attitude of trying to see how we shouldn't have an attitude of trying to see how much you can do. Right. And still be acceptable to God. See, to do verses 12, 13 and 14 in chapter 13, you will not develop that attitude. Right. 
Well, hey, you know, well, you know, if it's okay, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do what I can, you know, I'm gonna do as much as God will allow me to do. Right? That's not the attitude that those three verses will create in an individual that makes that commitment to God, right? The mindset is changing, right? You're going all after God. So that's not gonna be your mindset, it's to do as much as you can, right? It's gonna change. So let's see. Oh. Okay, so let's hit a little background a little bit. So we know when we first started this book that there was some tension between the Jews and the Gentiles because they were different, made up of two different types of uh, believers, right? The Jews originally was more Jews in the Roman church than there were Gentiles. But when the Jews got kicked out, the Gentiles kind of took over and they changed things and they didn't have to abide by the rules and the laws and traditions of the Jewish Christians that were there. So when the Jewish Christians came back, they kind of scratched their head because it wasn't like the way they left it, mm, right? And it's not really that much, I mean, you know, you can't really blame them. I mean, the Jews had the law for over 1400 years. I would sure. say it's sure. fair to say it's kind of hard to stop yeah, after having something part of your tradition and your culture for over a millennia. You know what I mean? And this is becomes what translates into what you believe pleases God. Amen. Right. And the Gentiles, they were pagans for just as about as long as the Jews had the law. They were pagans. Right. So they're bringing that baggage with them as well. You know, and so they were wanting to stay away from certain things because they never had the, the idea of one God to them is, is a foreign idea. They had many gods, and then they accepted the, the religion and the gods of the people. They, I mean, they had gods coming out everywhere. Amen. And so now they're, they're committing to this one God, which to them is a foreign concept, right? And Paul talks about this, too. This is not the only time he talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. He kind of goes through it again where he's talking about the same subjects about eating and things like that. But again, this is about unity in the kingdom that's what the crux of this chapter is about mm. so before we get going i figured why not upset you guys in the beginning so <clears throat> Come on. so i want you to take note of something before we even start take note of your position i'm just gonna there's just a few of them it's not an exhausted list on the following topics and where you stand on them right alcohol mm. music Come on. dancing Come on. tattoos Come on. Marriage bed. Mm -hmm. Right. Where are you on those items? Do you consider them sinful or not sinful? So this is where we're going to start. All right. Verse one. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. And you guys know I'm reading the Amplified because I love it. Verse two. One person believes he may eat anything. While the weak person eats only vegetables. Verse three, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats for God has welcomed him. Mm. So let's define a few things. Weak uh, in Greek is asthenio, meaning feeble, uh, to be doubtful about things lawful and unlawful to a Christian. Right. Faith is not meaning the saving kind of faith that we're talking about. It's our confidence, uh, our belief. And it comes from the root word pietho, which means to be persuaded. Right. Amen. So what does it mean? The one who is weak in faith. So uh, a believer that is weak in faith is a believer who thinks something is wrong when it is not wrong. Mm -hmm. A believer who co whose convictions are more strict than necessary. Amen. So the 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 list that I gave you in the beginning, those are things that are that are we get to the thing welcomed by God. They are in God's liberty. So if you feel and have a conviction about those things right here, Paul calls you weak. Amen. He says Come you're on. weak in faith, not weak as a Christian. 
Let's not, this is not overall weakness as an individual. You can be full of the Holy Spirit and, and working in authority and, and all of that. But in these situations, Paul describes individuals that hold that position as being weak. And then it says, welcome him. The word welcome is proslambano, which means to take to oneself. So he's not talking to the weak in faith. He's actually talking to someone that's opposite that, the people that are opposite of weak, which is strong. Sure. Right. Amen. So he says, welcome them, take them unto yourself. Right. But do not quarrel over opinions. So it's not sin that Paul is addressing. He's addressing opinions. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Whether you like that or you don't like that, that's scripture. That's right. They are op Amen. opinions. That's right. And we have many opinions and personal convictions in our lives today. Mm -hmm. But Paul is saying they're just that. He says one person believes that he can eat anything. Right. That's the freedom in Christ. That's the freedom in Christ. Right. That I can engage in these things that that God has not said yay or nay about in certain in certain instances. It says while the weak person eats only vegetables, but there could be a reason for that. So and what Paul is not saying is that the weak in faith is a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Right. Because when you hear weak, you'd be like, well, I'm weak. Go me weak. You know what I'm saying? I cast out devils. Not, it's not in that sense. It's understanding where you are and based on where you are. And there could be good, viable reasons for one to have convictions on those things that I mentioned earlier. There could be good, viable reasons based on your past, based on experiences, based on 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 what God has for you to do your purpose, his will for your life. It could be good, viable reasons that you have those convictions. And Paul is not saying that that's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. You're just weak in faith in that area. Amen, amen. So it's not a bad thing. He says, uh, let not the one who eats, this is considered the strong, and I'm going to put that in quotes because they have weak, so there has to be an opposite. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. So that means the one that that understands their liberty. Right. And you have a person that says, oh, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. Paul said, don't despise them because they 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 either don't understand the liberty and what that means or they have made a choice based on those viable reasons that I mentioned before that they cannot partake in that particular mm -hmm. behavior or or conduct. Amen. Right. It says, so the weak believer is not to judge the strong believer. Now, that's the thing that we see the most. Yeah. We see, well, I don't do this and you do that. So I'm judging you. You're not that strong of a Christian and you're not that spiritual because I don't do that. And you're doing that. So you got the problem. That's right. Amen. Not according to Paul. He says, don't judge. Don't judge. He says, what? Because because what? God has welcomed, welcomed him, taking them into himself. He's welcomed both. Right. He's welcomed them both. So he's welcomed the one who understands their liberty and he's welcomed the one that has that has put limitations on their liberty. He's welcomed them both. And this has caused division and it can easily cause division. In this example, Paul uses eating and not eating. But like I said, I gave you a list before and it's not an exhaustive list, but there could be other things on that list. But, you know, just just for sake of using Paul's example, you got people that eat meat. Right. And people that don't eat meat. And then the people that, you know, goes, well, are we going are we going to get some meat? You know, and he goes, yeah. Oh, brother, you don't understand your your liberty that you have in the Lord. And other words, like, you don't understand your sanctity. Right. And they're going back and forth. And all of a sudden, what? They're not fellowshipping. Mm -hmm. The meat eaters eat together mm -hmm. and the veg vegetarians eat together. That's right. right? Mm -hmm. This is what Paul is talking about, the unity. But no, he doesn't mention specifically reasons why people may or may not eat meat. Why? Because it's not important. Amen. 
Amen. Two, because it can be true for generation after generation after millennia after millennia. That's why it can apply to us today. We can use it and it makes sense because we don't care what we eat. If that's the case, if you go into a Chinese restaurant and you see the Buddha, you know what I'm saying? You wouldn't eat the food there because all that food is, you know what I'm saying? Right. All of that food is do or dedicated to that idol. Mm. Right. But we know we have freedom in that. They didn't get it then. That's right. right. We know now. Because God knew that once the, the Gentiles were accepted into the faith, that all kinds of stuff was going to come. Right. Sin is still sin. That's right. That has never changed. But there are cultural differences in some respects. Right? right. People did different things. Now, we, we measure those cultural differences up against Scripture. And if there's anything that our culture is doing that it comes against what the Scripture is saying, we need to dump it. Amen. Amen. We need to be Amen. willing to do that. You know, right. Dia de los Muertos. Come mm -mm. on, come on. That's right. Mm -mm. That's right. It's cultural. I get it. But when you when you pair that or parallel that up against the word of God, mm -mm. Right. you got to be willing to let that stuff go. That's right. Amen. And it, I'm just saying that because that's the first thing that came to my mind. But there are other things in other cultures mm -hmm. that the same thing that when you pit them against the word of God, they do not stand. Right. And we got to be willing to let them go. Amen. That's right. So we have to be sure that we're not partaking in or helping in division, yes. yeah. right? We, we tend to create these circles, right? right? See, the thing about it is that we learn just enough about the human condition as we learn about God and as we learn about Christ and the Holy Spirit. We learn about the human condition. And the human condition is to surround ourselves with people that think like us, that do what we do, mm -hmm. Right. And so, and if anybody tries to come into our circle that doesn't think like us and doesn't do what we do, we do what? Yep. Right. We kick them out the circle. Amen. Paul is saying, don't do that. Right. Wait, we should be able to understand that there are differing in liberal liberty, areas of liberty. I'm not talking about sin. I'm not talking about that. So when you have these differing, right? Who's right? Right? Who's right? Paul is saying, don't worry about it, mm -hmm. right? If your conviction is not to eat, then that's what you do. If your conviction is not to participate in those things that I mentioned before, then don't do it. He's not even saying change your convictions. That's not what Paul's saying. If you have those convictions, keep them. Amen. Keep them, right? But the, the thing about it is, is that the the motivation behind it or 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 the understanding behind it is what needs to change. Right. If this is my conviction, I need to understand that this is my conviction, that I can't put it off on everybody else, especially I mean, it being in an area of liberty. I can't push that off on everybody else. Amen. Right. But I, but I, I'll hold to my convictions because they're my convictions. And Paul is saying you should. If your conviction is not to eat, then that's what you do. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's neither one of our jobs to convince you otherwise. Verse 4. Who are you? Now, this is a rebuke, right? Paul, don't wait too long to come with the rebukes. He says, who are you to pass judgment on and censure another's household servant? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he shall stand and be upheld for the master, the Lord, is mighty to support him and make him stand. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Paul is saying, who do you think you are? And who is he talking to? He's talking to the strong. Or is he talking to the weak? He's talking to the weak. Amen. He's talking to the one who abstains. That's who he's talking to. Who do you think you are? And he uses the analogy of master and servant. Right. How can someone disapprove and condemn the conduct of somebody else's servant? Mm. This is what Paul is saying. They don't belong to you. And you have no authority over them. So let's let's get some some Greek here. The word stand it says it is before his own master that he stands or falls. The word stand is the Greek word stikai. Means to stand firm or to stand uh, upright. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. So and then the word fall falls comes from the Greek word piptiai. It means to fall from a state of uprightness. So it's saying that this servant 
that don't belong to you before their master, they will either be upright or they will fall from a state of uprightness. Amen. Right. Amen. He says, but, and he shall stand. So, but he shall be upright. If I can change stands, be upright and be upheld. The Greek word for that is stathi satai. That means to cause a person or thing to keep his or its place, place to keep intact. So what it says is that the master, the, the servant will stand and be upheld by who? The master. For the master is mighty to so uphold him, to keep them intact, right, to man. cause a person to stay in their place. Amen. Right. The power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit is big enough to take care of that situation. Amen. We don't need to be mediators. Let the Lord handle it. He is the master. That's right. Amen. And we are all accountable to God. That's right. Verse five. One man esteems one day as better than another, while another man esteems all days alike sacred let everyone be fully convinced in his own mind he who observes the day observes it in honor of the lord he also who eats eats in honor of the lord since he gives thanks to god while he who abstains abstains in honor of the lord and gives thanks to god Amen. some of the standards and practices in our churches today are traditional but they're not necessarily scriptural. That's, right. That's why it is important to know the word, because when you don't know the word, you give the enemy an opportunity to bring about division, That's right. there, thereby making the kingdom of God impotent, That's right. That's right. not being able to do anything because we too busy cat fighting amongst each other Preach, teach about stuff that is of no consequence That's to right. God. Right. This is what Paul's saying. It is of no consequence to him. Right. He's accepted them both. Mm. Those who partake and those who don't partake. Right? We need to stop majoring in the minors. Come on. Come on. Right? We worrying about this little stuff, but, but, at, but at the same time, the world is taking over and taking possession That's of right. things that belong to God. That's right. And we not fighting them. We cat fighting with each other. Mm. Right? And I don't even care if I don't get boots. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna preach or teach or whatever my husband say I got be, to not get boots. But the LGBT community then stole the rainbow, right? And what we do is we've taken their redefinition of the rainbow, and now we don't want to got nothing to do with the rainbow. No, the rainbow belonged to God. Right, God amen. put the rainbow in the sky. That's Go cool. get it That's back. Right. Amen. Come amen. on. Yes. Right. Let's stop allowing them to take take territory. Take it back. Right. It belongs to God. Amen. Amen. We let the, the, the world redefine sexuality and they take that territory. And now we take that definition and we put it on us. And then we behave accordingly as if our sexuality is bad. God created sexuality. Yes, Stop taking on the enemy's definition. Redefine it. Teach that and take it back. Amen. 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 Come on. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God told me in the beginning it was all about definitions. Amen. And what he is doing is he is redefining what was his to define in the first place. That's right. It's been redefined by the world. It's been redefined by the enemy. And God is saying, no, that's the wrong definition because this church has been silent. Mm. It's not come back and said, no, that's not the definition this is what scripture says yes, right and we need to stop allowing them to gain ground amen. we need to st set up a standard and we need to push back that's right amen regardless of what that looks like or what that means you gotta stop being scared that's mm. right amen so the reason i said about the tradition i read this and i kind of chuckled to myself it said there was a time when dedicated christians opposed uh, listen to the radio mm. because Satan was the prince of the power of the air. Mm. You see what I'm saying? When we, when we take stuff and we just kind of run with it, that sounds ridiculous, <laughs> right? That's because it was ridiculous. But if we focus on things or we, or, or we have these own personal convictions and then we try to spread them out, right, to, to the populace of the kingdom, that's what it looks like. 
It looks ridiculous. Right? You had those that, that said that, you know, well, the Bible says that, you know, women shouldn't dress like men and men shouldn't dress like women. So women can't wear pants. I'm wearing pants. These are women's pants. I don't wear men's pants. Sure, right? I am still feminine. Mm -hmm. But when you take that and you want to throw it out on the populace, it looks ridiculous. Because it was a personal conviction to begin with. Mm -hmm. And now you start stamping that on everybody. And it looks ridiculous. Not only to us, it looks ridiculous to the world. And it is a misrepresentation of what the kingdom is. It makes us look, look like, like fanatics. Amen. Right? The kingdom of God is an intelligent group of people. I want to make that clear. We are, we are not deniers of science. We are not ignorant. We are not stupid. Right? We are not in a fairy tale. We are highly intelligent people. That's right. Amen. We know how to use logic. We know how to use reasoning. That is who we are. But when we do stuff like that and we stamp it on everybody, it makes us look ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It makes us look less than who we are. Amen. We are intelligent people of God. Right. We are reasonable. We are logical. We are analytical. That's right. Amen. We are smart, not stupid. But when we do things like that, it makes us look like that. Amen. So he talks about esteeming all days alike. It could be different things, right? The Sabbath, mm -hmm. right? Special feasts, Christmas, Easter, because there's some folk out there that think that's pagan. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't celebrate that as Christians. But Paul is saying, God's not holding that against you. Right. Because, again, if you go back to to chapter 13 in those last three verses, if your mindset is there, you're not doing this in a pagan way. Right. Oh, celebrate Christmas. Right. But I'm sitting here and I'm reading, reading to my kids about Luke chapter two. That's right. Right. In the birth of Jesus Christ. That's right. Right. That Amen. ain't pagan. That's right. Amen. That ain't pagan or, or Easter. Or, or scrap the bunny. I, I don't care about the bunny. Right. right. But we go on to learn about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. People invite their family and friends to hear an evangelical message at their church. Amen. That ain't pagan, y'all. Amen. Amen. If you don't want to worship Easter, don't. If you don't if you don't want to celebrate uh, Christmas, don't. But don't put that on everybody else. Because if your mindset is where it should be at the end of chapter 13, Amen. that would not be in your mind anyway. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. Hallelujah. Because I know when I was a kid, we didn't celebrate Christmas because of that. When I got old, I celebrate Christmas. My kids know ain't, ain't no fat white dude coming down my chimney, though, <laughs> giving them no gifts. Their mom and daddy worked real hard for them gifts. Uh -huh. and, and we don't want to bless them with that. Right. And God, first and foremost, blesses us. So that's what our Christmas is about. That's right. We need to cut it out. So here the Bible is clearly teaching that there is no preference. Right. It doesn't matter which day you worship on. And it doesn't matter which day you choose to observe as long as you do it unto the Lord. Amen. 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 That it is pleasing in his sight. And we know what that is. You can't go to the strip club and say, I'm going to the strip club and I'm praising the Lord. That's stupid. Come on. <laughs> and you didn't get your end of chapter 13 right. That's why you're thinking like that. That's right. That's right. Listen to a wrong voice. Right? right. So if that if you feel there's a particular day you need to worship on, you do that. Mm -hmm. If there is a particular uh, day that you want to observe, right, it glorifies God, you do that. The motivation for both instances should be to honor God. Yes, That's right. amen. That's what it's about. And again, Paul is not specific on the days. Why? Because through as time continues to go, that's why God's word is true the same 2,000 years ago and today. Because God knows that things change. But the principle behind the matter is the same. He's not going to get specific about the issue of that time because he knows that human beings are retarded. And we would take that and say, oh, that's the only thing God means. Amen. That, that's what you're talking about right there. He's not talking about this stuff that I want to do over here. No, he, did, he wasn't specific in what days. Because people are the same no matter how much time passes. Mm -hmm. So the principle 
is what remains the same, is yeah. what stands the test of time, is what is applicable for 2,500 years. Amen. Verse 7. None of us lives to himself but to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And none of us dies to himself but to the Lord. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or we die, we belong to the Lord. Amen. That's right. For Christ died and lived again for this very purpose, that he might be both Lord, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Amen. That's right. So check out the reoccurring phrase to the Lord, to the Lord, That's right. to the Lord, Amen. to the Lord. So anything, like I said, with the strip club and anything else that you want to try to throw in here, you know, that ain't to the Lord. That's if right. you know it's not to the Lord, get it out of here. And that's not what Paul's talking about. That's right. right. To the Lord. Everything we're doing is to the Lord. If you choose to partake in the area of liberty, it's to the Lord. If you choose to abstain in the area of liberty, it's to the Lord. Right? The important thing is not whether you're categorized in the weak category or the strong category. It's that each one has to conduct their lives in the consciousness of God's presence. That's right, what we're doing, is this going to please God? Is this in line with scripture? Right? Is, 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 is this, and if you don't find that, then you check your conscience, mm -hmm. right? And your conscience is full of your past experiences. Right. Everything that you used to do, that you thought you was big and bad enough to do. Mm -hmm. And now we're with Jesus. And some things, honestly, brothers and sisters, some things, it's like, whoo, I can't do that. Because, you know, that's I was. Right, yep. And that's okay. That's, right. that's what Paul is saying. That's okay. Even though you have the liberty to do it, you don't have to. That's right. Amen. But don't judge others who don't have the same convictions as you, That's right. Amen. is what he's saying. Right? Because God's approval is more significant than the approval of man. And here's the other thing that he's talking about. He's speaking to the lordship of Christ, to the Lord, because Christ died and lived again for this very purpose that he might be Lord of both the dead and of the living. Amen. It is speaking to the Lordship of Christ and his Lordship transcends life, right? It transcends this life. That's right. It is his, he's Lord in the afterlife. Cause he says that every knee, will, oh, that's coming up, but every knee will bow Amen. and every tongue will confess. Amen. Hallelujah. Right? So you're not living when you do that. That's on the other side. That's right. When every knee will bow. Right? That's in, that's in the afterlife. So he's Lord here and he's Lord there. That's right, man. right? So how we treat others regarding our convictions comes down to the Lordship of Christ. You let Jesus be Lord of your life and you let Jesus be Lord of theirs. That's right, amen. Amen, amen. You don't need nobody to be the mediator. You know what I'm saying? In these areas, again, in areas of liberty, we're not talking about out and out sin that the Bible has explicitly spoken against. That is not what Paul is talking about. That's right. He's talking about these areas of liberty. We need to stop trying to be the mediator. That's mm -hmm. right. Praise God. Verse 10. Why do you criticize and pass judgment on your brother? Mm -hmm. Or you... Why do you look down upon upon or despise your brother? Mm -hmm. Now, he's talking to both of them now, mm -hmm. strong and weak. Amen. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. Yes, right. For it is written, and he says, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me mm -hmm. and every tongue shall confess yes. to God, acknowledging him to his honor and to his praise. And so each of us shall give an account of himself, Amen. give an Lord. answer Amen. in reference to judgment to God. So why are we worrying about what other Christians do? Amen. Amen. Right. And, and to do that and to love, you know, in, in respect to the to the weak. And I, and I use that because that's what Paul used. Right. The weak uh, in faith and the strong is when the weak in faith judges. Right. That's a carnal attitude. Amen. When the strong despises. That's a carnal attitude. Yes, amen. So it's saying there will be a day of reckoning, right, for believers. Now, this is not the great white throne judgment. 
That's not what we're talking about. This, when we stand in front of God, the, the believers, is for our rewards. Right? It's not in regards to our sins because they've already been paid for. But knowing that there will be a day of reckoning means that our actions matter. That's right. Amen. That what we do matters. Yes, right. yes it does. Amen. Because isn't it reasonable to say that when you stand before the Lord, he tells you what rewards you get. By default, you know which rewards you didn't get. Mm -hmm. Come on. Just reasonable. That if you know you got one, two, and three, four, that you did not get five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. That's right. So what we do matters. And we all have to give an account to God. That's right. Amen. And because of that, and because of his lordship, we don't get to determine other people's convictions. Amen. We don't get to tell them that. That's not our job. As a teacher of God's word, that's not my job. My job is to teach the clarity of scripture. Amen. That is my job. My job is not to make, give you convictions. That's, right, right. that's the Holy Spirit's job, and I'm going to step Amen. out of the way. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. Right? I don't decide your convictions. I tell you what the word says. And if you love the Lord like I love the Lord, and when he gives me something ooh, that hurt, and he's telling me this is something that I need to do that is a requirement, or he gives me a commandment not to, I got to take that. That's right. Whether I like it or not, whether I'm in my feelings, it doesn't matter. That's right. And I pray you're like that too. That when he says something, that it comes out of his word, that regardless of how you feel about it, it is truth. I don't even care. Amen. Right. Amen. Lord, help me get in line with your truth. Amen. Right. Amen. Not you get in line with my feelings. Come on, Jesus. So here's a little, another story that I thought was funny. Right now, everybody uh, knows the two. You know, there's two great um, preachers in England in the Victorian era. Mm -hmm. Charles Spurgeon was one, and Joseph Parker was another one. Mm -hmm. And both of them, they were mighty preachers. I mean, we even still know about them today. That's, right. That's how mighty the Holy Spirit used them. So there is no doubt that they were men of God. Amen. There is no doubt that the Holy Spirit used them in a mighty way because we still know about them now. Right. We're Amen. still reading their books now. We're still reading their sermons now. Right. Early in their ministries, they fellowshiped. They even exchanged pulpits, which means they preached at each other's church. They had a disagreement. They were mighty, but they must not understood this part. Mm -hmm. Chapter 14 of Romans, they had a disagreement and the reports even got into the newspapers. That's how much mm -hmm. they disagreed. Oh. Spurgeon accused Parker of being unspiritual because he attended the theater. That's uh, equivalent to us going to the movies, right? Interestingly enough, Spurgeon smoked cigars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a practice many believers would condemn. Who was right? Who was wrong? Right? Perhaps neither. Perhaps both. The point is, Paul is saying, God has accepted or welcomed them both. He's not concerned about that. Mm, right. Come on. Right? But it got into the paper. It got so bad. Right? So when it comes to questionable matters in the Christian life, can't we just agree to disagree? Mm, amen. That's the right. thing. Can we just agree to disagree and then continue the work of God, continue the furthering of the gospel? Because when we can't agree to disagree, then it halts there. Then I can't do anything with you. Right. As far as as furthering the gospel and doing God's work, because we are all members in the body of Christ and we need each other. I don't care. You, you go to such and such and such Baptist church on the road. It don't matter. You are a member in the body of Christ and we need each other. Amen. Amen. But when you have these ideals, when you think that because we don't agree, I can't do anything. You're fracturing the kingdom. Amen. The kingdom is fractured. Right. And can anybody do anything with a fractured bone or a fractured limb? You can limp. Maybe. But you got to be supported, right? Amen. And the leg is supposed to do the walking, but because my leg is fractured, now I lean on what? The arm, right? Now I'm looking at the arm to do something that the leg is supposed to do. That's right. Because we're fractured over things that God's not concerned about. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Verse 13. So here's, here's, the, here's the command, so to speak. Let us no more criticize and blame and pass judgment on one another, but rather decide and endeavor never to put a stumbling block or an obstacle or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know I am convinced, this is Paul is saying, I know I am convinced, fully persuaded, as one in the Lord Jesus that nothing is forbidden as essentially unclean, but nonetheless, it is unclean to anyone who thinks it is unclean. Amen. So in this one, he says, let's not pass judgment. He's talking to the weak brother. But then he turns around and now he's talking to the strong brother or sister. He says, instead of criticizing and blaming each other, let's think about deciding, making a decision to never put a stumbling block or an obstacle in front of our brother or sister. Amen. Amen. Don't be a hindrance to them. Right. So even though in the, the previous verses were talking about liberty and we're talking about those who choose to eat, those who choose not to eat. OK. Do you. Right. If you want to eat and you understand your liberty in Christ again, not more liberties than God gives you. That's right. Amen. Um, then, OK. And if you are convicted to abstain, OK. Right. God, God has welcomed you both. God has welcomed you both. But now he tips over into an area. Now he's mostly addressing the strong person, right? Mm -hmm. The person that understands their liberty in Christ, right? Understands what it is, even whether or not they choose to abstain, but they understand it's an error. It's a, it's an issue of liberty, not an issue of sin. But we're going to get to that because it can become that. Amen. So let's look. So Paul says, I, I know I am convinced, right, as one in the Lord, that nothing is forbidden as essentially unclean. So let's look at Paul. What kind of man is Paul for him to make this statement that he's saying that nothing in and of itself is unclean? Let's go to Philippians chapter one, verse 20. Give you all a little bit of time to get there. <laughs> OK. It says this is in keeping with my own eager desire and persistent expectation and hope that I shall not disgrace myself nor be put to shame in anything. But that with the utmost freedom of speech and unfailing courage, now, as always, heretofore, Christ will be magnified and get glory and praise in this body of mine. And be boldly exalted in my person, whether through life or or through death. Amen. So this is what he's saying. He's saying Christ is never going to be. Right. Uh, 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 defamed. I'm not going to be put to shame. I'm not going to be disgraced. I'm not going to disgrace Christ. I'm not going to disgrace the gospel. Right. That that. Today and forevermore, basically, Christ will be magnified. He will get the glory and the praise in this body. He's saying in my body, God is going to get those things and he will be boldly exalted in my person. I will talk about him. I will preach the gospel boldly, whether through life or through death. So he's committed. He got his Romans 13, the last three chapters, right? This is what he said. He's fully committed. He is not going to be an ambassador of disgrace Amen. to the gospel. So he makes this statement in Philippi, he confirms his commitment that he's living a life. That's right. But then he turns around in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. So this is the same man, right, who's, who's committed himself to the Lord, committed to live a life in a conduct that is pleasing to God. First Timothy, chapter four, verses three through four. <clears throat> Verse three. He says, who forbid people to marry and teach them to abstain from certain kinds of foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe 
and have an increasingly clear knowledge of the truth. Mm. For everything God has created is good and nothing is to be thrown away or refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. This is the same man. So, so this is not a man that is looking to make sinful things not sinful. Amen. Right? That is not his intention or his purpose. Paul is not looking to soften the stance of the scripture on sin. That's not what he's looking to do. He is not trying to make sin more accessible to believers. He's not trying to do that either. Right? That's the point we need to understand. We're talking about this man that has committed his life to the servitude of Christ and preaching the gospel. And he is saying that these are the issues of liberty. That's right. Because he said previously in Philippians that no disgrace or shame will come through his body. Jesus. So those that desire to make sin not sin are not in Christ. Mm. Mm. You over here. Because if what you're hearing today, and you're thinking, well, right? Or some the, or or you have been abstaining and you and you hear what I'm saying, you go, oh, I can do that. Get your Romans chapter 13 together. Mm -hmm. Come on. That's not the right attitude. So, you know, they don't have the mind that Paul has, that he's showing us in these scriptures. He's further defining liberty. And, and believers that hold this viewpoint as, as, as liberty or may differ from the convictions one may have of that list of things I gave earlier, they're not backsliders. They're not carnal Christians, right? They're in Christ and they understand their liberties in Christ. Amen. Again, no more than what Christ gives. That's right. And in, and in uh, verse 14, Paul makes sure to state when he's describing himself, he says, I know that I am convinced as one who in the Lord Jesus Christ. He made a point to put that in there. So, you know, when I'm saying this, I'm saying that essentially these things are not unclean, that, you know, I am in the Lord Jesus Christ. When I say this, Amen. I'm not outside. That's right. right. I am not sinful. Right. I am. This is not sin. This is not what I'm talking about. This is what he's saying. I'm in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say being in Lord Jesus Christ, nothing in and of itself is essentially unclean. Amen. But if it is unclean. It is unclean to anyone who thinks it's unclean. Mm, that's right. That's the thing. That's right. If you're convicted of that. And your spirit is unclean, then you're absolutely right. He says we don't want to be a stumbling block. A stumbling block is literally something against which one may strike their foot, causing them to fall. Mm -hmm. Right. An obstacle presents the picture of a trap designed to ensnare a victim. So so in this case, the stumbling block would be a strong, you know, a strong believer trying to change or violate the convictions of a weak believer right. to encourage them to do that. Right. Oh man, it ain't nothing wrong with that. The, the, we got liberty in that. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Mm -hmm. Try it. Mm -hmm. It is fine. Hallelujah. Thank you. Yeah. Right. That's wrong. Yep. That's right. You are making right. that, trying to make that person violate their convictions. Mm -hmm. You are in sin. Amen. That's right. Amen. If it is a conviction for them, let it be a conviction for That's them. Right. It is not your job to try to bring them over to the, well, you think it's the light side, but you know what I mean? It's not your job to bring them over to, to, to your way of thinking. But that's the human condition. We want people to think like us. We want people to be like us. Paul is saying, no, don't be a stumbling block. Don't try to get them to do what you know is okay to do. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. But if it's a conviction for them, let them be. Mm -hmm. Come on. For reference, let's go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. 16. 16. Matthew 16, 23. Amen. It says, verse 23, but Jesus turned away from Peter and said to him, get behind me, Satan. 
You are in my way, an offense and a hindrance and a snare to me. For you are minding, minding what partakes not of what partakes not of the nature and quality of God, but of men. So we know this is familiar with this one. That's when Jesus was telling his uh, disciples that he was going to have to die. And Peter goes, oh, no, no, Lord. No, no, no. May it not happen to you. But Jesus knew who it was coming through him. Right. And it suggests that Satan will use whatever method. Right. right? That he can to get one of God's children to fall. And at this moment, Satan wanted Jesus to fall. But it wasn't nothing bad. Like, oh, no, Lord. Oh, no, you don't have to die. No, no, no. But that's what he came for. Mm -hmm. That's what he came for. Right. He knew why he came. That's right. But to try to convince him otherwise exactly. was sin. That's right. And that's why he rebuked Satan. Exactly. So when we don't have a conviction of something in the area of liberty and we do that or we try to convince our brother or our sister to do that, we are a snare for them. Exactly. Right? The enemy is using us to, to snare them. Mm -hmm. We're being a tool. That's right. So in these verses, Paul is appealing to the strong Christians. And it's a warning, right? That their example, even, even if in some cases you, you may exercise your your rights right in liberty in front of your fellow brother or sister that have a conviction about that paul is saying don't do that because right. it can have negative effects That's right. on the kingdom Amen. that your example may have a disastrous effect on those who are weak by leading them to do what their spiritual development and that's their maturity or their convictions disapprove of it's a warning don't do that don't do that. If you're sitting down with, with a, a brother or sister and they have a conviction about alcohol and you don't because that's in the area of liberty. Hey, respect their conviction. That's right. That's right. Respect their conviction. Because even though there's truth, it always has to be balanced out with love. Amen. Right. If you think it's unclean, then you're right. It is sinful for you. Don't violate your conscience is what God is saying. Amen. Don't violate your conscience. Now, the conscience isn't everything. We don't do everything by our conscience because there's people out there that can do all kinds of stuff and don't feel mm -hmm. nothing. Right. It ain't. The, the conscience is not the one that reigns supreme. That's right. But in areas that are gray or not fully spoken to explicitly in Scripture, then we go to our conscience. And our conscience should have changed and grown. Our conscience changes and grows with knowledge. Knowledge of the word of God and based on our knowledge of the word of God and who we've come to know who God is and Jesus Christ is and the Holy Spirit is. Then we can reflect our conscience because our sure. conscience have grown because of that. Sure. But your conscience here it is. Your conscience can make things that are clean, unclean. Mm -hmm. And that's the person that has a conviction to them. It's unclean. But in the area of liberty, it's not. But to them, it is. So your conscience can make clean things unclean. But your conscience cannot make unclean things clean. Right. And I think we had a little, little talk about that when we did our marriage workshop. You know, we we're talking about the marriage bed and things like that. And I was saying for sure, things that God have already spoken of and spoken against are not allowed in the marriage bed. Mm -hmm. Right. Your conscience, whether you agree with it or not, is not going to make those unclean things clean. Just because you put them in your marriage bed. That's not how it works. Right. It can make clean things unclean, but your conscience cannot make unclean things clean. So if you was doing whatever, whatever before you got married, or before you came to know Jesus. And now you want to bring that. And he's already spoken against that in scripture explicitly. Don't you bring it to your marriage bed. Amen. Don't you bring it to your marriage bed because your conscience because you OK with it does not void what the Bible and what scripture has said about it. That's right. So that's the limitations of the conscience. Threesomes and all that. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. You already talked about adultery. Get that out of here. Verse 15. But if your brother is being pained or his feelings hurt, or if he is being injured by what you eat. 
then you are no longer walking in love. You have ceased to be living and conducting yourself by the standard of love toward him. Do not let what you eat hurt or cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. Mm. Do not therefore let what seems good to you be considered an evil thing by someone else. In other words, do not give occasion for others to criticize that which is justifiable for you. After all, the kingdom of God is not a matter of getting the food and drink one likes, but instead it is righteousness and heart peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And he who serves Christ in this way is acceptable and pleasing to God and is approved by men. Amen. So what Paul is saying, let's not have liberty in our brothers and sisters face. Even though you have the liberty to do so, that we need to be concerned and we need to to think about our brothers and sisters. You know what I'm saying? We got people from all walks of life that come to Christ. Sure. You know what I'm saying? You got to have a person that was an alcoholic, right? Well, for them, that's going to be a conviction, don't you think? But if I'm in there, hey, you know, and, I'm, and, and I have something to drink in front of them, am I considering my brother? No, I'm not. Mm. Right? And that makes him think, well, well maybe I can. Mm. Maybe I can because they're doing it. Maybe I can. Not them. Mm. And now they take a drink, what? And they're off the wagon. Yeah. See, we got to think the, the, the kingdom of God is not about eating or drinking or whatever. It's about people. It's about people. That's, right. That's what Paul is saying. It's about people. Not about what you got the right to do. And if we love the people of God, then we should be willing to make those sacrifices for the people of God, for, for the kingdom of God as a whole, because we want whole people. The limits are placed on the people that are strong. He didn't place any limits on the ones that have the convictions for the areas in liberty. He didn't do that for them, but he put it on the people that understand, the people that, that got it. That understand that these are areas of liberty. And if my brother or my sister are struggling in an area and it's a conviction for them, then I need to respect that. Then I need to love them. Right? right? I need to love them and let the Lord do his work. Stop trying to be the Lord over their life. That's right. The strong is actually required to change their actions. We're actually required to change our behavior for our brothers and sisters. God is trying to preserve unity in the kingdom. That's what this chapter is about. Unity. Stop majoring in the minors. Stop breaking up churches because we didn't put the piano in the right place. Stuff like, I mean, it's stupid stuff. And the enemy is holding his sides. He laughing so hard. She is. You know, he's like, oh, Jesus, on my side. Oh, he laughing so hard. Because we over here fighting about stuff that God is not concerned about. Mm -hmm. And if he is concerned about it with you, he will address it with you. Right, amen. Because again, we serve a, a, a relational, a holy God. Yes. So if he got a problem with it, or he thinks it needs to be a conviction for you, guess what? He'll give it to you. That's right, amen. Let God do his work. Amen. So let's not focus on the rightness or the wrongness, right, in these areas. That's what it is, because I want to be right. I want to be right, right? You're wrong, I'm right, right? We're supposed to be worshiping on Saturday and you're on Sunday. I'm right, you're wrong. I don't believe that God speaks to people. You do, I'm right, you're wrong. You think God's concerned? Mm. He is big enough. Right. Here's the thing. He is big enough. He is Lord enough. Amen. He is powerful enough. Yes, he is, is all-knowing enough Amen. to be able to manage all those issues and things in each and every one of his children. Yes, He's big enough. Amen. He don't need our help. That's right. Again, in those areas. Now, if you got a you know a brother out there committing adultery, oh man, come here, let me talk to you for a second. Right. We gotta that's speak right. up on that. Yeah, that's right. We need to speak up on that. It's sin. Right, it's sin, and we need to address it for the sake of their soul. Amen. And for the sake of the kingdom, so that it doesn't spread like a cancer. That's right, amen. 
That's why we do those things. We don't speak up to embarrass that person. We want to save their soul. We want to get them back yeah. to where they need to be. Right. But we also don't want that behavior to infect the kingdom as it is now. Just as much as, as, as marital affairs, as they call them now, or, or what's, what's the name? Why do you call it? Entanglements. Mm -hmm. Happen in the world, they happen in the church. Right. Husbands and wives are cheating on their spouses in the church as much as the people are out in the world. That is something that should have been spoke of at the beginning before what? It infected the kingdom, right. and now it's infected the That's kingdom. Right. Divorce is the same rate as it is in the world. That's ridiculous. So if we consider ourselves strong, if you're one of those believers that consider yourself to be strong, then we got to be willing to make those sacrifices for our brothers and sisters right. to keep the unity in the kingdom, to keep the kingdom strong. Praise in Lord. verse uh, 17, the word righteousness used there. It is not the justification. The righteousness doesn't mean justification. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the right conduct to which the believer is called to obey the will of God. Amen. That's what he's talking about. Not that. Because none of this affects your, 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 your salvation, your justification, your sanctification, anything like that. These are preferences. Amen. These, these are convictions. These are personal. And that's awesome because when we make those, the decision that you do at the end of chapter 13, that the Holy Spirit will make up a whole bag of convictions just for you. Why? To keep you. Because he said further back in chapter 8 Amen. that he will justify you and then he will keep you right. in the justification. He puts you in the place of righteousness and he does whatever he can to keep you there. He sanctifies you and he keeps you in that place. Amen. So he already said that's what he does. So when you make that decision, he's going to oppress upon your heart, right? These convictions, why? To keep you there. Right? You can't, yeah, yeah, I know it's a liberty, but you don't need to be doing that. Because if you do, you're going to be back over here. Right. So I'm going to give you a stack of your own personal convictions, why? To keep you here. Right. Keep you justified. Keep you sanctified. Right. Amen. But they're yours. They're not theirs. They're yours. Because I'm a personal God and I love you. Verse 19, so let us then definitely aim for and eagerly pursue what makes for harmony and for mutual upbuilding mm -hmm. of one another. You must not, for the sake of food or whatever liberty, undo and break down and destroy the work of God. Mm -hmm. Anybody want some ice cream? <laughs> Everything is indeed ceremonially clean and pure but it is wrong for anyone to hurt the conscience of others or to make them fall by what he eats mm, the right thing is to eat no meat or drink no wine at all or do anything else if it makes your brother stumble or hurts his conscience or offends or weakens him mm, amen. that is love even though i got a right to do it if it hurts my brother if it hurts my sister i'm not gonna do it that's right that's what makes us different from the world. The world is always shouting about what rights they got. I got a right to do this. I got a right to do that. My body, my choice. Right? All day long is about what they're, what they're going to do. Everybody got to sacrifice to what they want to do. I'm feeling oppressed. I'm feeling, you know, all of this other kind of crap. Systemic racism, all of that. Mm -hmm. But it's about me. It's not about our brother or our sister. Right. That's what makes the kingdom different. And if we start looking like the world, then why the world going to want the kingdom? Amen. Come on. Amen. We got to show love. What do you say? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples Amen. if you have love one to another. Amen. So Amen. somebody asks you, do you drink? No. No, I don't drink. Well, well, you know you can. Yeah, I do. But I don't because I got a brother. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Or I got a spouse. Or I got another family member. They have, they have issues with that. So I love them. So I stand where they stand. Amen. That's right. We don't need to use our liberties to wound one another. That's right. Right? That's good. So here we go. Verse 22. Your personal convictions on such matters, right? Just talking to the strong person here. Exercise them as in God's presence, keeping them to yourself. 
striving only to know the truth and obey his will. So, hey, if you like to, 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 to drink some wine or whatever, do it at home. Don't do it in front of your brother or your sister that you may offend them or cause them to violate their convictions. Some people are about to unfriend all of us right now because I said that. <laughs> right? We're about to lose some followers right now because I said that. But what happens, right? At what cost? Because if you can't get this, then the kingdom stays fractured. Mm -hmm. Then the kingdom stays impotent, immovable, right? Think about it. Like I said, what do you do with a fractured limb? You wrap it up in a cast. You immobilize it, right. right? And you put the pressure on another limb of the body because that limb can't do what it's supposed to do. And spreading the gospel and telling people about Jesus is more important than being right or your conviction. Or your freedom, for that matter. Blessed is he who has no reason to judge himself for what he approves, who does not convict himself by what he chooses to do. But the man who has doubts and then eats, perhaps because of you, stands condemned before God because he is not true to his convictions. And he does not act from faith That's right. That's right. for whatever does not originate and proceed from faith is sin. Mm. Whatever is done without a conviction of its approval by God is sinful. Amen. Amen. So if you are considered strong and you're trying to convince someone to do something that they have a conviction against, you are causing them to be con to be condemned before God because it wasn't their idea. No. Their idea was not to do it. They listen to you, right? So it wasn't based on faith, right? Them understanding that God gave us certain liberties and things. And, and I understand that. It wasn't based on that. That's faith. I know. I'm, I'm persuaded. I understand what scripture is saying. I understand what Christ gives us in that area. It's not based on that. It's based because they saw you doing it and you kind of convinced them and told them, oh, come on. And now you've caused them to be condemned before God That's right. because it didn't originate. With him, because all faith comes from him. That's right. Amen. It didn't originate with him. It originated with you. And now they're condemned because of you. Because they did not stick to their convictions. Because God did not free them from that conviction. Because whatever conviction he gives you, at you that you get at the end of chapter 13 that he puts on you to keep you justified and keep you sanctified. If he gave it to you, only he can take it away. That's right. And says, you know what? Okay. You're free. Only he can do. That's not our job. That's not our job to convince them. That's not our job to do that. And when we do that, we put them in jeopardy. That's right. We put them in condemnation with God because they did not what? Act on faith. He did not clear it. All faith comes from him. So again, this chapter is not about foundational, doctrinal, fundamental essentials of the gospel. That is not what this is about. It is about areas of honest disagreement. And we cannot make those areas of honest disagreement a test of fellowship. Right. We can agree to disagree. We can come together. We can fellowship with one another. Right. right. We can work together in the field together. We can evangelize together. We can we can feed the homeless together. We can do a lot of things together. Even if we disagree That's right. on these secondary Amen. issues, Amen. but there's a lot of work to be done and we need to stop allowing these issues to get in the way. That's right. Let God do his work. Amen. He's a big God. Amen. He's Amen. big enough Amen. to handle your life and every life on this planet, Amen. which is Amen. eight billion people. Amen. Amen. That's the God we serve. Right. And we need to stop being God's assistant mm. Come on. Amen. and trying to tell other people what to do. Again, in these areas, right. if it's sin, you need to go to your brother or your sister because that's love to allow them to continue in sin. I don't even know what to say about you. Mm, that's right. If you see your brother or your sister in sin and you don't say nothing, Come 
and you allow them to continue in sin, God's looking at you because you got the answer. You, you help them back. Put them in front of scripture. Minister to them. That's what you do. This is not what Paul's talking about. That's right. That's right. But we need to get back to God's business. Amen. So here's some final thoughts and takeaways. All right. Number one, these issues are not inherently sinful. They're not inherently sinful. I know some of y'all, I lost some more followers. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Number two, they are still sinful to some people. Amen. Even though they're not inherently sinful, they are still sinful to some people because of the personal convictions that they That's hold. Right. Because of the personal convictions and faith that God has given them. Because he wants to keep them. Number three, the conscience can make something sinful that's not, but it can't make something okay that is actually sinful. Mm, amen. So don't depend on your conscience in that respect, right? Don't don't depend. You know, now we're gonna stop asking God in Scripture, and we're just gonna go with our conscience. No, that is not what he's saying, right? Is not the primary test. <clears throat> as to the righteousness of a thing. You don't go to your conscience first. You go to God. Right. You go to scripture. Yeah. It is a secondary test. That if you go to God and you go to scripture and there's nothing there, now you go to your conscience. Right? The primary test is what does the Bible say? Right? Not how you feel. We got to get out of our feelings, y'all. Because right. it is ruining the kingdom. Right. right? It is killing the kingdom. Because we are in our feelings, how I feel, and what I feel, and what I like, and God don't care. That's right. Sorry. That's right. Because it's about salvation. It's about drawing people to him. It's about the gospel. Yes. And that has nothing to do with your feelings. That's right. Now, should we, you know, be blunt objects in the kingdom? No. And God will help us with that because Lord knows I am one. I will be a blunt object in a hot second. And it took the Lord to begin to soften my edges. Amen. But when he puts things in scripture, your feelings did not go into it. That's right. It's truth and it's righteousness. And that's all it is. Amen. Not your feelings. Number four, the strong bears with the weak Amen. instead of trying to change them. Amen. Right. We're not going to try to change you and convince you and force you to understand that this is your liberty. And why are you acting like that? Amen. That's not our job. Amen. Right. Amen. Our job as a strong is to bear with the weak. Amen. And that as they see their example and as they read their word and as they grow and come to understand. Right. And there's some of us that were mighty women in God, but we've been mistaught. Mm. And we've dragged this baggage around as we've grown in Christ and we fractured. The kingdom, everywhere we've gone. We just need to be taught right. That's right. Get our, get our heart right. Get our minds right. Fix, be in, be in the same mind. And go on and do God's work. Yes, absolutely. So the, I'm not saying that we're immature in scripture and things like that. But according to Paul, you're weak here. And we need to be strong here because being weak here hurts the kingdom. Mm. It divides the kingdom. And God wants unity. We need unity. We got a lot of fighting to do. Number five, don't violate your conscience. If you are convicted on something that is in the area of liberty, do not violate your conscience. You stick to that. You don't change. That's not what Paul is saying, to change. No, you need to understand, though, that that's your conviction. That you can't put that off on other people and you can't judge people because they don't do what you do. That's the lesson for those that are considered weak in that area. And there are areas that I'm weak in, according to Paul. Because for me, that's a conviction. I can't do it. I won't do it. And you should do the same. Amen. And the main point of the chapter number six is unity. That's what it's about. Yes, right. It's not about I'm right, you're wrong, and ha ha, Jesus said I can do it. That's not what it's about. It's learning. What the Bible is teaching us is having sound foundation. That's what it's about. That's it. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Woo. Powerful, powerful Amen. Amen. word from the Lord. An eye-opening Bible study. Yes, indeed. Um, 
I believe it's in uh, Second Timothy uh, where it says, "Do not uh, argue and 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 uh, fight over uh, you know traditions and other uh, stuff." It's right here. If it's if it's if it's not a salvation issue, Amen. Quit arguing about Amen. it. Amen. You know, Amen. Uh, Amen. you know, just uh, be strong in the Lord and let's come together Amen. and be one unit in Christ. Right? right? Amen. We need to unify so we can take on the enemy, the real enemy, That's right. not fight amongst each other. Right. You know, but then like like Minister Carey says, we do gotta be aware. That if you know that there's a brother that has a weakness in something, That's right. then we need to be um, aware of that, Amen. take note of that, and then, you know, uh, uh, make sure that we don't uh, uh, allow them to stumble by that's doing right. something that we know that that's their, there's, that's their battle and, and we shouldn't go in and, and, you know, make them stumble, you know, that's just right. because Amen. we're okay with it, okay? Amen. But what a powerful word of God. I, I just thank the Lord that, man, the Holy Spirit, whoo, man, the Holy Spirit always comes through. When He wants you to understand something, and I know that there's many, because I know I did, they opened my eyes, but I know there's many out there that today is like, wow, okay, now I know, now I see, I understand, and I thank you, Lord. So, with that, before uh, Pastor Henry comes up, I'm going to close us out in prayer right quick. Oh, I'm sorry, my wife. I did not know that. <laughs> I'm going to bring up my wife, uh, Minister Claudia, and she'll close us out in prayer. Praise the Lord. Amen. Father God, we come together with a thankful heart for this word, yes. Lord, this yes. awesome word to yes. remind us that your word is like a double-edged sword, yes. Father God, and today yes. it cut through bone and marrow, yes. Lord, yes. and I pray yes. that it's cut yes. through some issues that we have yes. of the flesh, Father God. Yes. I, For a matter of fact, I know it cuts yes. through some issues of the, yes. of the, of the flesh, Amen. Father God, Thank and I pray that those who are hearing this message, whether it be today, tomorrow, or in the future, Father God, yes. that this seed is planted, that they welcome it into their heart, Father God, and that it begins to cut off whatever needs to be cut off, Father God, from the body of Christ, Father God. Whatever gangrene is clinging to the body of Christ, Father God, may be cut off right now in the name of Jesus, Father God, so that we can be a healthy body, a bride, free of any blemish and any wrinkle, ready for you to receive, Father God. We ask that this word today, it's, it's a conviction for somebody, Father God. It is a wake-up call for somebody out there today, Father God, and that it gives us a heart of Christ and a mind of Christ to love our neighbor as ourselves and to love God above all else, Father God. If anything today, allow us to have a heart of Christ and a mind of Christ, Lord, through this word, Father God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us this message today through our sister Carrie, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, everybody watching at home. Yes, Lord. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's all I can say about Romans chapter 14. Um, Man, Minister Kerry, I thank you for allowing the Holy Spirit to yes. use you. I can understand what you meant by that was a tough chapter to study because it hits home first, praise God's holy name. And it dealt with an issue in the kingdom that has been tearing the kingdom apart. Um, even from when I was growing up in the church, yes. personal convictions were made sin. Even when I was growing up in the church, mm. can't wear pants, mm. can't go to the movies. All these things that the church deems sin, but the word of God does not deem it to be sin. And we as men and women of God, we begin to adapt those things in our lives. And as the word of God said, we begin to portray them on others and tell them just because we have an issue with it and God saying it's not sin. Now we made it sin. So we're bringing conviction up on our brothers and sisters mm. and that's not right. That's right. And we cannot stay unified as a body of Christ. We can't fight in the kingdom as a body of Christ when we allow our own personal convictions. Like, for instance, I used to wear earrings back in the day. I have to say this. And I, it was part of my persona. It was part of who I was out there. That's who I was, the smooth daddy, the mag daddy, my earrings. It was all part of that. That was my life. That was my thing. I took great pride in that. But when God began to move me into the kingdom of God, now, nothing worth saying nothing about me and my earrings. There's men and God wear earrings right now. But I cannot allow 
God's personal conviction on me because of who I was called to be in the kingdom. That's right. 